Two young boys in Kenya were cutting grass. The grass was high and they were working without realizing towards each other. And as they were swinging the, that long knives, I know what they call it, not sickles, they have, it, uh, it, it, they, have they have another name, machete, yes, the machete or machete, they were swinging it, they didn't know they were so close that one voice cut his friend. And then he picked up his friend and he ran to the nearest mission hospital. These are jungles. There's a little mission hospital there. And they ran there and the missionary doctor is laboring over that boy, trying to stem the flow of blood, trying to stitch him up. When suddenly the mother burst into the room. The boys hadn't told anybody. And the doctor looked at the mother and said, how did you know where to find your son? The breathless mother said, it was easy. I just followed the blood. If we follow the blood, it won't be easy, difficult to find him. Today I want to speak about the blood, the blood of Jesus. Then we will come to the table. I want you to turn with me to the book of Revelation. And chapter 12. John sees a crowd of witnesses. He's seeing into the future. All those who will stand before God who have won, who have overcome the enemy, who have overcome Satan, who have overcome sin, who have overcome the world, and he sees this multitude gathered around the throne of God. And he says, I heard a loud voice. Revelation 12, 10 and 11, saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ has come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. That is Satan. Satan means accuser. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony and did not love their lives to the death. That one verse, in Revelation 12, verse 11, it tells you how you and I overcome the enemy. There is an enemy. There is an accuser. And all that we face is because of his lies and his deception. He has strongholds established in us. He uses that. He has this world over which he has power, authority, which he uses to surround us. Yet scripture says, God's people are overcomers. They overcome and they defeat the accuser of our brethren. And how does he accuse us? He accuses us day and night. Remember, the only way you can overcome him is by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's why he is called the Lamb of God that was slain before the foundation of the world. It's by the blood and by the word. By the blood and by the word. My word and your word has no power. Even if you quote scripture, it has no power unless the blood is applied. The word works because of the blood. That's why Jesus is not called the Lamb of God who was slain 2000 years ago. He's called the Lamb of God that was slain at the foundation of the earth. Even before man had sinned, he was the Lamb of God. And as far as God was concerned, he was slain and the blood was applied by faith. And it is by the blood the word has power. It's by the blood when we speak and we walk and we claim the word of God, it has power. So remember, we overcome him by the blood. I want you to turn to John chapter 8 where Jesus says, Jesus answered the most assuredly I say to you, whoever comes with sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever. But the Son abides forever. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you are? Everyone who sins is a slave of Satan. Everyone who walks in sin is a slave of the enemy. For the Son of God came so that we wouldn't be slaves, 
but we would be sons and daughters of the living God because only a son abides forever in the house. Only a son abides forever in the house. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. And how does the son make us free? He makes us free by the blood. No blood, no freedom. Because the wages of sin is death. The penalty has to be paid. So there it started. So we are going to follow the trail of the blood. We are going to follow the trail of the blood today. And we will see that each one of us sitting here as a child of the living God. If you are a child of the living God, you are sitting here only because of the blood. And we need to learn to believe, apply and appropriate the blood on every area of our life to walk in victory. Because the enemy is not scared of anything but the blood of Jesus. He flees before the blood. So we are going to look today at the blood of Jesus. In Genesis chapter 17, after a silence of 13 years, God appears to Abraham. Abraham had walked in the flesh, and when you walk in the flesh, you sin. When you walk in the flesh, we create a Ishmael. He was not asked to create an Ishmael. He was asked to create a Isaac. Isaac is of God. It is born of God. It is a spiritual of offspring. Every fleshly offspring is an Ishmael. All of us are called to walk by faith and then what the Spirit of God does through us is Isaac, not Ishmael. Ishmael, when we create Ishmael, we sin and there is a silence from God. For 13 years, God did not speak to Abraham. Because if you look at, you don't have to turn, the previous verse you will see when Ishmael was born, Abraham was 86 years old. And chapter 16 ends with that. The next time God comes to Abraham, he is 99 years old. And God tells Abraham, we need to do something. You are the father of believers. He appeared to Abraham and said, I am the almighty God, walk with me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. He says, we need to make a covenant. God had in Genesis 15, if you know, made a covenant with Abraham. And if you remember, he put Abraham to sleep and he did not make Abraham be partaker of that covenant in the sense Abraham didn't have to do anything. It is God alone who walked between the blood. But now he tells Abraham, you have now to shed blood to become part of the covenant. Now the shedding of blood is not from God, it is going to be from Abraham. And in chapter 17, circumcision is instituted. When circumcision is instituted, the shedding of blood is by man. And then the covenant is ratified. What is God telling? He's telling Abraham, you shall not walk in flesh. You will never walk in your flesh. Let us have this covenant of blood between the two of us. That you will not walk in flesh, you will walk in the spirit. And then what will happen? You will walk before me and be blameless. If you walk in the spirit, you will walk before me, you will be always there walking with me, before me, and you will be blameless. And that is how the covenant begins. The old covenant is a covenant of the blood. And the blood is basically the blood of circumcision. And the lamb. The lamb represented Jesus, the blood of the circumcision represented man. And these two bloods come together and we have the Old Covenant. The Old Covenant was very difficult. Nobody could keep it. But you cannot cancel the Old Covenant until it is fulfilled. Unless it is fulfilled, you cannot cancel the Old Covenant. So somebody has to step into our time and keep the Old Covenant to the full. That's why Jesus said, I have not come to abolish the law but I have come to fulfill. To fulfill the law, he has to come in the flesh. And he is not only enough to fulfill, to come in the flesh, he has to be a partaker of the old covenant. 
for your and my behalf. He has to be partaker of the old covenant, fulfill it, then the old covenant is gone, then only a new one can come. So you will see in Luke chapter 2 and verse 21, when eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, that the first time Jesus bled, the shedding of blood has begun. The shedding of blood has begun. Why on the eighth day? Eight in the Bible is new beginnings. Seven days of man. Six days, seventh, thousand, seventh day Jesus comes again. He will rule for a thousand years. At the end of seven thousand years, sin will be completely destroyed. There will be no more sin. Satan is locked up forever. Sin, death, everything is removed. On the eighth day begins a universe without absolutely no sin at all. So on the eighth day is the new beginning. The Son of God has come. He sheds blood and the new covenant. He is walking into the old covenant and fulfilling the old covenant in himself. We think this is shed blood at the cross. No. He shed blood seven times. And each time he shed blood, he was completing the work. And now we walk in the completed work of Jesus Christ. The first time, remember, is Luke 2.21. There he sheds blood and becomes part of the Old Testament, of the Old Covenant. <coughs> The shedding of blood was when man entered into a covenant with God. Even Moses was almost killed on the way to Egypt, for his sons had not been circumcised. Do you remember that? In the book of Exodus, Moses was almost killed. Moses was almost killed. I don't know where it's there, there. No, it's not there. You don't need it. And you remember Zipporah, his wife, circumcises his son on the way and throws the foreskin at his feet and she says, You are a bridegroom of blood for me. You are a bridegroom of blood for me. Who is Moses for Israel? Moses represents Jesus to Israel. And our bridegroom is a bridegroom of blood for us. The covenant is a covenant of blood. Jesus enters into that covenant by the shedding of blood for all of us and fulfills the covenant. And in him we are made complete and freed from the law. The cutting away of the flesh means complete separation from this world towards God. And it's only when we are in Christ Jesus we are separated from this world and unto him. In the garden, the curse began. Remember the garden? It all began in the garden. The curse began in the garden. And God had said, by the sweat of your brow, by the sweat of your brow, and everybody's work became cursed. How many of you actually like working? Enjoy your work. <laughs> Most people don't enjoy their work. You know why? Because work was cursed. Work was there before the curse. But because of Adam's and Eve's disobedience, sin, work was cursed. And God said, now work will become toil for you. There will be no satisfaction in your work. And that symbol of that curse was sweat. The next one. Genesis 3.19 In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. By the sweat of your bread, of your brow, you shall eat bread. Everybody is working basically for bread. That's why Americans call money bread. Everybody works, but that was not the way it was in the garden. In the garden, you did not work for bread. The bread was already given. You worked because that's what your father did. You didn't have to work for your bread. Now work is cursed and everybody is under that curse. Everybody, all of humanity is under the curse. So it doesn't matter how much or how well you have worked, nobody has satisfaction. Everybody is miserable. Everybody is miserable. And then God comes in the flesh 
and he begins to work and he shows us how to work in the spirit how to listen to the father's voice and not let the world and the flesh control us in the work and there you will see in the garden in this garden of gethsemane what was lost in the garden of eden the son of god getting it back for us in the garden of gethsemane and scripture says in that night in the garden of gethsemane he was struggling in the flesh because he says father take this cup away from me that's when we struggle when you're walking in the spirit and walking and doing what god tells you to do there is no struggle there's no struggle you need to realize if you are actually walking with god and doing what god tells you to do there is no struggle in your work because you just have to do what you have to do the result is all in god's hands and your provision is no longer connected to your work it's only when you detach yourself from god's will and start struggling in your flesh you are under the curse and scripture says jesus started sweating blood he started sweating blood and that's when second time he sweats blood and that's when you will see he breaks the curse now it's not enough to know this in your head it's not enough to know this in your head by faith each day of your life you need to apply the blood of jesus over your work apply the blood of jesus over your work and walk in the spirit and you will see your work does it over power you your work produces its result and you are no longer a bondage of your work most people are anxious and worried because they are not sure whether their work will produce the rewards that's why in the new covenant paul says paul plants apollos waters but god gives the increase therefore the one who plants and the one who waters is nothing the god who gives increase is everything he says i'm not worried about the increase i plant maybe somebody else waters but increase only comes from god that's the difference when the blood has been applied you just do what god tells you to do and you don't have to worry about the result you don't have to worry about the result so the second time we see jesus shedding blood is in the garden and god is asking us today have you applied the blood do you believe in the blood or are you still toiling and laboring and never enjoying your work you never have enough time you are never able to finish your task on time because we are still operating under the curse and not applying the blood on our work not walking in the spirit and not doing the things which god asks us to do everything was lost in the garden one of the first things when man falls what he does is man hides from god look in genesis the next genesis 3:8 and they heard the sound of the lord god walking in the garden in the cool of the day and adam and his wife they hid their faces from god that's a result of the curse man is hiding from god and from one another we all put up fronts everybody is looking good today it's just a front in the house of god we are honest we are not ashamed of our past if we have opened it up before god we are not ashamed there's no shame when we are hiding we are hiding because we are hiding from the face of god we hide from the face of god and the earth is full of people who are hiding from god from walking with god and talking to him face to face we lost face and we lost the privilege to talk to him face to face adam lost it for us that privilege was taken away we could never look him in the face again next generation genesis 4 you see the same thing the next son also says the same thing genesis 4:14 surely you have driven me out this day from the face of the ground i shall be hidden from your face I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth. And you have hundreds and millions of people who are fugitives and vagabonds on earth. They are doing a lot of things but they are hiding from the face of God. They are not able to talk to God. They are not able to meet him face to face. Even Moses after 80 years when the Lord appears to him in the desert and reveals who he is scripture says in Exodus 
3.6 Moreover he said, I am the God your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. And the next thing was, God says, he hides it. Hides his face. Oh how we longed to wish to look at God in his face. To be able to face God. And Jesus got that privilege back for us. Consumed by shame and fear, man has been hiding his face from God and one another. So we put on a face. Even when we put on a face, we are actually hiding our face from God. So it says in Luke chapter 22, verse 63 and 64. And now the men who held Jesus mocked him and beat him. And having blindfolded him, they struck him on the face and asked, him saying, prophecy, who is the one who struck you? Matthew 26, 67. And they spat in his face and beat him. And others struck him with the palms of their hands. They did two things. They beat him on the face. They beat him on the face. They spat him on the face. You know why? For so that's a face of shame. We were ashamed to look at God. And we were ashamed to show our real face to one another. And he is taking all that shame and rejection upon himself. They beat him on the face and they spat him on the face. But that still doesn't bring redemption. You have to be redeemed so that you can look God face to face. You can look him at the face for that you have to be redeemed by the blood. And redemption is only through the blood. So turn with me to Isaiah chapter 15 and verse 6. I gave my back to those who struck me, we'll leave that, my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard. And I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. Did you get it? They pulled his beard off and he started bleeding. And they spat on his face and sweat, spit and blood flow down and be very deep. Now we can look God face to face and call him Abba, Father, because there was blood that was shed. He shed his blood so that we could become sons and daughters, look at their father's face. Sons and aliens and strangers may not look at God's face, but sons and daughters look at the father's face because somebody was willing to take the shame and the rejection upon his face and he shed blood and restored us back to God so that we could look at him face to face and then also look at each other face to face. We are not ashamed. Lots of people will say, how can you say such terrible things about your past? It's because there is no more shame left. It doesn't exist. People will say, how come Joyce Mayer goes around the world talking about her past? It's because there is no shame. He has taken the shame. There is no shame. It's only people who do not have God will hide their past. I'm not saying you should go around talking about your past. But if God tells you, you don't have to be ashamed, speak about it. It will bring healing for others. You are able to speak because there is no shame. Because he took the shame. Because he did not hide his face. Therefore today, I don't have to hide my face. He took the shame and the spitting. Therefore, I don't have to take the shame and the spitting. Amen? That's what Jesus did. His face was covered so that my face could be revealed before God. In Mark 14, 65, you will see. Then some began to spit on him and to blindfold him and to beat him and to say to him prophecy. And the officers struck him with the palms of their hands. All the four Gospels will mention how he was beaten on the face. There was a massive lord that was placed on our back by Adam in the garden. Sin brought this burden on us. You know, all of us find it so difficult to carry this load called life. Well, life was given to be lived in freedom. That's why Jesus said, all those who are weary and burdened, come to me. I will give you rest. But where did this burden come from? 
There is no cost about a burden in the garden before sin came in. The burden came in. You know why? Because of sin. And sin has put this weight on our backs. Everything connected with life becomes a burden. People study and their study is a burden. They think if I get a job, I'll be free. They get a job and they find job is a burden. Then they think if I get married, at least I will share my burden. They get married and find marriage is also a burden. Then they think maybe a child will come and the child will free me of this burden. The child comes and your burden gets added to. Then you think if the child grows up, I'll be relieved of this burden. The child grows up and adds more burden to your life. Then you say, let the child marry and go and then I'll be off my burden. The child marries and goes and your burden increases because now there is nobody to look after you. The burden never goes. We carry this burden. Our minds are burdened. Our spirits are burdened. And our bodies are burdened under the weight of sin. And in Psalm 38 and verse 4, the psalmist says, For my iniquities have gone over my head, and like a heavy burden, they are too heavy for me. We don't realize the burden is not because of what we face. The burden is because of our sin, our iniquity, and our transgressions, which are on our back. They are on our back and they have become so, so heavy. So God says in Isaiah 53 verses 4 to 5. Surely he has grown our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities and the chastisement of our peace. When the burden is lifted, what do you get? You get peace. And by his stripes, we are healed. Next time he sheds blood, is when they scourge his back. They scourge his back and put the whole burden of sin, the whole burden of life on his back so that we could walk free. That the next time he sheds blood. Therefore, Psalm 55 and verse 22, God will say, Cast your burden on the Lord and he shall sustain you. You don't have to carry the burden anymore. The burden of sin, the burden of iniquity, you and I do not have to carry anymore because somebody carried it for us. And you need to believe and you need to apply the blood. That's when the healing comes. Healing is threefold. Healing is in your soul. Healing is in your spirit. Healing is in your body. And that's why the healing there mentioned in Isaiah is threefold healing. And it came when his back was broken and the burden of iniquity was lifted. There he is he's broken and he's bleeding and we are set free. And only Jesus could carry that weight of humanity and he did. And we are following that trail of blood. Circumcision. Sweat, the face, and the back. You need to realize he is restoring one by one things back. He is entering into the law because the law cannot be cancelled until it has been fulfilled. So he enters into the law through the blood, fulfills it and cancels it for us. He makes our work a pleasure back again by the sweat of his brow. He makes us able to look God at his face by the blood of his face. He takes the burden of my back and brings healing to my mind, to my spirit and to my body by the blood from his back and then in the garden, the ground on which we operate was first. It was given to man and you know what God tells man actually? He says, rule over this world. It is not just live in this on this earth. He says, rule over this earth. We were called to rule over life. We were not meant to be slaves. We were not supposed to be in bondage. We were sons of the living God to rule over this earth. But because Adam and Eve chose to believe Satan, they gave sovereignty over to Satan and became his slaves. And then the ground on which they have to operate becomes cursed. And you will see in the book of Genesis. And then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat. Cursed 
is the ground for your sin. What is cursed? The ground is sin. You know, everybody, all of us operate on a ground. So many grounds we operate. Students operate on a ground where they are students. They have to study and they find it difficult. Home we operate on a ground. Workplace we operate. Everywhere we interact, we have to do something. There is a ground on which we operate. It's not just the farmer who tills the ground. Everybody is operating on a ground. And the ground has been cursed. And as a sign of the curse, God said, What shall your ground bring forth? Thorns and you shall no longer rule over the ground. Instead, the ground shall rule over you. And everybody is being ruled by the ground. We are not ruling the ground. The ground is ruling. And what is the symbol of that curse? Thorns. So everybody is unhappy. Everybody is going through pain. Everybody is going through hurt because the ground is operating against you. And therefore, scripture says, when they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed, reed is the sign of, in his right hand, they were mocking him with the scepter. They did not put a, the thorns around his waist or his shoulders. They made a crown. You know why? Because they had to make a crown and put it on his head and he had to bleed to get sovereignty back to us. They didn't realize it. God had given Adam a crown on earth. You shall reign. You shall rule. And he had the scepter. Spiritually he had a crown and a scepter to rule the whole earth. Taken away by Satan. Now the second Adam is coming. And is crowned with a crown of thorns. And he's got a reed in his hand. They were mocking him. But in the spirit as he's shedding blood. He's regaining sovereignty back for us. As he shed blood. He's saying, you will not rule over the world. That one day you will rule over the world when you become an overcomer. But you shall reign over life. Satan shall not rule over you anymore. You shall rule over life. You shall be kings. You know why? Because he was shedding his blood for you and me. We need to realize this. We need to apply the blood. How you apply the blood? By faith, you apply the blood by saying, Lord, my ground has been set free. Because you shed your blood for me. And that's basically what he did. The curse was pronounced on our ground, thorns it would produce. Whichever ground man has tried to operate, it is cursed. The home, the field, the office, the government, you could be the most successful person in history. But realize a little later, it has got no meaning. You remember the most successful person in the eyes of the world was Alexander. Because at the age of 33, there was nothing left for him to achieve. He had conquered the known world at the age of 33. Yet when he died, he made a statement to his generals. When you take my dead body, leave my hands out of the coffin, so that the world will know I achieved nothing. You know why? Because you can achieve everything in the flesh and find your ground has been cursed. It will not bring you any satisfaction. Yet... Once you have been freed by the blood and you apply in your life and you are walking free, you are not looking at the ground anymore because the ground is not operating against you. And you can stand there all alone, abandoned by everybody, in a Roman prison, waiting for execution and you are still able to know, I know whom I have believed. I have run my race, I have finished my course and I have got my victory and I know there is a crown set for me. You know why? Because the ground doesn't operate anymore against Paul. Because the blood has set you free. And God is telling each one of us, you should be able to tell it today. I know what is said before me. I know the crown that he has set before me. And Paul says in that verse, not only for me, but all those who walk in that expectation, there is a crown set for us. We know it. Because the crown cannot be taken away now because he shed his blood so that we could be crowned. He allowed himself to be crowned with thorns so that we could be crowned with authority. And that's what scripture talks about. And that's the next time he actually bleeds. They gave him a crown. They gave him a scepter. And Jesus says in the book of Revelation, If you overcome as I overcame, you will sit with my father on the throne and reign along with me. I will give you a crown and I will give you a scepter. And then there is a problem. Still not over. Redemption is still not over. Because my work is there, my worship is there, 
my weakness is there. My worship, my work, and my weakness is represented by my hands. You know that in the Bible, the worship, the work, and the weakness is represented by the hands. And my walk with God is represented by my feet. Both has to be redeemed. So scripture will say in Psalm 7 and verse 3, O oh Lord my God, if I have done this, if there is iniquity in my if I have iniquity in my hands, I cannot lift my hands unto God. I cannot worship Him. And the next one, Psalm 26, I will wash my hands in innocence, so I will go about your altar, O oh Lord. Before I have to worship, I have to have my hands washed. Only if you have clean hands, I can worship God. I cannot worship God. I cannot lift my hands unto God without a hands that is washed by blood. Because my hands were called to worship. Psalm 47, 1 will say, Oh, clap your hands, all your people. Shout to God with the voice of triumph. If you are not able to clap in the house of God, better apply the blood. You will see your hands will rise on its own. If you are not able to lift your hands unto God, apply the blood. Psalm 28, verse 2. Hear the voice of my supplications when I cry to you, when I lift up my hands towards your holy sanctuary. These hands were called to worship. These hands were called to live to be lifted. You know these hands, you and I can bless God. Psalm 63 and verse 4 says, Thus will I bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. Can you imagine you and I blessing God? God says you can. You know why? Because your hands have been washed with blood. By the blood of my Lamb. You've been called to worship. You've been called to worship. You've been called to bless God. You can bless me back because you know what? You are my son. Don't parents, when they grow a little older, get blessed by their children? Do they? If you know the story of Joyce Meyer, abused by her father, all that mess she went through, when her father grew old, what did the Lord tell her? Get a house for him. You got a house for him. Take care of him. Do care of him. No, he did. That's not your business. You bless your father. Bless him. Did she bless his father? She blessed her father. And then one day, he accepted the Lord and she and they baptized him. You can bless your father. God is saying, you can bless me. I don't need anything from you, but you can still bless me with your hands. You can lift up your hands and bless me. He is our father. But before I can bless my father and worship him, my hands have to be washed. He has to establish the work of my hands. Otherwise, my work has no meaning at all. Psalm 19 and verse 17 will say, And let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us, and establish the work of our hands for us. Establish the work of our hands. After I worship, I start working. But if I work, I have to do His work, and He has to establish the work of my hands. He has to establish the work of my hands. And that's what Jesus does. Yet when we stand before God, we stand before God like Moses, called, but cannot be sent. Moses, look at your hands. Moses, there is sin and iniquity in your hands. You remember 40 years ago, Moses, you killed a man and buried him in the desert, in the sand. And when the winds of time blew, the sands uncovered a dead body. Yet I have chosen you, and I am sending you. Put your hand on your breast. Take it off. His hand is white and leprous as snow. Because out of the heart proceeds all that is sin. And his heart is God iniquity. His hand is God iniquity. And God says, put your hand back on your breast and take it. And his hand is cleansed. His hand is cleansed now. Moses' hand has to be cleansed before he can go into Egypt and represent God. Unless my hands are cleansed, and your hands are cleansed. We do not represent God. We do not worship God. We do not work for God. We have no witness for God unless our hands are cleansed. So to cleanse my hands, on that day, he bled from his hands. When they nailed his hands onto the cross, he was setting your and my hands free to worship him, to work unto him, and to witness for him, not for any other purpose. Therefore, wherever you are placed, you work unto him. 
wherever you and whatever you do you worship him and then the witness that follows is not my witness or your witness it's his witness hallelujah remember when solomon built that temple that beautiful temple solomon built and in the holy place when solomon was told what he should adorn the holy place he said you should adorn it with cherubim nobody knows palm trees and open flowers he said everywhere you shall make pictures of cherubim palm trees and open flowers cherubim palm trees and open flowers palm tree is a tree which is very familiar to them the most useful tree on planet earth because it can be put to 366 uses they have worked it out can be put to 360 uses a use per day cherubim signifies worship what do cherubim do they are worshiping god holy 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 an open flower not closed flower what is an open flower it sends its fragrance cherubim worship palm tree work open flower witness and today we are in the house of god we are the temple of god and in the temple of god what should arise from this temple worship work and witness don't change the order worship work and witness it will be an open flower not closed flower it will be an open flower and that's what jesus did he released us and made us his temple so that out of the temple will arise worship and work and witness that happened when his hands were nailed to the cross and then my feet represent my walk with god scripture says in the cool of the day god used to come and walk with man walk with adam man was created you need to realize the very purpose god created us is to fellowship with us and fellowship is represented by walk so it is writ writ uh, written about enoch that enoch walked with god 365 years and then he was no more You know that you know walked with God for 365 years and God said you are walking too close with me come over you're too good for earth I'm looking for somebody who would walk with me that way you're too good for earth you come over I'm telling you we think the only two translated are Elijah many people have been called before their time they died because God said you're too good to be on earth come back and fellowship with me straight away a lot of people have died very young and they were extremely godly people But I got others to finish your work. You come over. I also need company. Our walk represents our intimacy, our fellowship with God, which was what was lost in the garden. In the garden, what was lost was that. Second Corinthians five seven says, "My people shall walk by faith and not by." They are called to walk by faith and not by sight. Romans eight one will say. Therefore now there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit when you walk according to the spirit you walk with God but to walk with God my feet needed to be restored my feet needed to be restored if i walk in the spirit god says it doesn't matter even if you are thrown in the fire i will walk with you if you have doubts he says ask daniel three friends I walk with them in the fire. I'll walk with you if you walk in the spirit. If you walk in the flesh, you will be alone in the fire. If you walk in the spirit, I'll be with you in the fire. Are you surrounded by storms? Do you think you will be submerged by the waves? He said, "Ask Peter. If you walk in the spirit, you will walk over your storms. You will walk over water. Doesn't matter how the sea is raging, you can still walk over it. If you walk in the spirit, God says, you will overcome the flesh." but to walk in the spirit my feet had to be redeemed my feet had to be redeemed so my hands and my feet go together i have to walk with god as i walk with god i worship i work i witness i worship i work i witness my hands and my feet go together so to redeem my fellowship with god my walk with god his feet was nailed to the cross and he shed blood and that blood redeem our walk with god now man can walk with god so you see the new covenant people were different from the old covenant people they walked with god they were not worried they were not scared they did not run away like elijah ran away from jezebel 
Paul did not run away from the prison in Philippi. He clapped and he sang and he danced. You know what? Because he's fellowshipping with God over there. The walk has been restored. Worship has been restored. God said, I'm raising up a new set of people who will worship me in spirit and in truth. So six times we have seen Jesus led. Hand and feet go together. That's not enough. Is that all God called me for? To walk, to work, to witness? Okay, sounds good. But God said, you haven't still understood what you are to me. We still haven't understood what we are to him. So there is Jesus on the cross. And he goes to sleep. Sleep in the word also signifies death. Because 2000 years earlier, God had put Adam to sleep. And he had opened up his side. And took a rib out and made the woman out of it. And given that woman to Adam. Adam looks at the woman and he says, in Genesis, bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. They were both naked, and man and his wife, they were not ashamed. There's nothing for them to be ashamed of because they were absolutely open and transparent with one another. Man looked at this woman who was taken from his side and he said, Bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. For this reason, I will leave my father and mother and I will cleave to you. And on the cross, when he was lying there on the cross, he also went to sleep for a season. Adam woke from his sleep. Jesus also woke from his sleep. It was not an eternal sleep. It was a temporary sleep. But when he went to sleep, a Roman soldier came, took his spear and pierced his side and from his side out came blood and water and his wife was born. You need to realize when he looks at you and me, he says, flesh of my flesh, bone of my bones. For this reason, I left my father and I cleave to you. For this reason. I leave my father and I cleave to you. For this purpose, I leave my father and I cleave to you. For the scripture says, in the gospel according to John chapter 19 and verse 34, But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. What came out? Blood and water. And 1 John chapter 5 verse 6 to 8 says, This is he who came by water. And blood, not by water alone, and blood. Jesus Christ, not only by water, but by water and blood. Nobody should forget. He came by water and blood, and it is the Spirit who bears witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. These three are one. But there are three that bear witness on the earth. The Spirit, because unless you are born of the Spirit, you are not a child of God. And when you are born as the Spirit, on the spirit, then the water and the blood agree that you cleave to him. That you are the flesh of his flesh and the bone of his bones. That's what happened. It's tough to believe. That's what salvation is all about. Salvation is not about going to heaven one day and let me have a roaring time on earth. Salvation is separating and being one with him. Because he says that's how I look at you. This is why I shed my blood so that you could become one with me. And when he, Adam and Eve were naked and they were not ashamed. When you are born from his side, you can look at him and you are not ashamed. You are not ashamed. There is nothing to be ashamed of. He's covered you. You are born of him. He cleaves to you and you are not ashamed. This is what the blood does. Do you believe? We've been hearing the word for, we've been hearing the word for ages. We've been hearing the word for ages. We are a small church. It's not enough to hear the word. We need to believe. We need to believe. Yes, yes, yes. We need to believe. Don't read that now. We need to believe in the blood. We need to believe in the blood. We need to believe that the word, what he says, is true. The wife. We need to believe whatever my husband says is true. 
he will not lie. You know why? I can believe his word because he died for me. That's enough. Very rarely will a husband die for his wife. But here is a husband who died for his wife. And I can believe it. And if you believe, Jesus said, all things are possible. We are a very small church. You know, we are very small. And I want as a church, we together make a church. I am not the church, you are not the church. We all together make the church and he is the head. The body does what is pleasing to the head. We are a very small church, a very poor church. In the eyes of the world, we are a very poor church. What is our worldly possessions? 50 chairs, 10 pieces of cloth called curtain, one keyboard, that the guitar and the violin belongs to the owners, an LCD projector. Our worldly belongings can be put in a trunk. That's all we have. But we have not put our trust in ourselves. We have put our trust in the one who called us. So sometimes we need to know, we need to believe. Because you see, when we don't believe, we don't do his work. And when we don't do his work, we don't have a witness. It's not about me, it's not about Elsa, it's not about any one of us. We do it together. The ones who come to clean the hall, the ones who clean the bathrooms, the ones who dust the chairs, the ones who put things up, the ones who serve, Rishi who does the recording, the setting up, all that. All that is part of it. We don't need technology, we don't need any of these things. A simple little thing like an MP3 player, we don't have any sophisticated stuff. But God is just looking into our hearts. Do you believe? Do you love me? And he will take that word of his from this and take it to the ends of the earth. I want you to read this letter along with me from the chaplain of a prison in America with over 3,000 inmates. <clears throat> Do you see that letter? It's a beautiful letter. Thanks. Dear Pastor James, it's not about me, okay, it's about him. Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior. Words cannot express how grateful I am. Your messages were sent well on time. His timing is perfect. His thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. I thank God for Mrs. Lewis. Mrs. Lewis is our sister Elsa. Has a burden for prisoners and she has been anointed to preach the good news to the poor and set the captives free. I wish to give you the names of the prisoners who are requesting to visit India to serve God as a missionary. The praise and the glory goes to our God and Savior. Mr. Sidney McFarland, Mr. Joseph Brown, and Mr. Paul Simons. Now listen to this. These three men have done over 20 years in the prison. They were very bitter and angry and carried this around for years. The first CD we heard was sin, iniquity, and transgression. Inmates repented, turned their life around, and started praising God for the truth that has set them free. The next CD was about prisons. It was three parts, and that was the icing on the cake. It helped tremendously. A lot of questions were answered. We listened to one CD twice in a Bible session. I have given them special permission to listen to the CDs in the prison library. I can see the change. And when the prisoners are at peace with God, it makes the officer's job easier and they are not so hard on them. I thank God for the next set we received from you, the Joshua series, which is also a great teaching for beginners. After repenting, the three inmates went to court. Their court date was not till 2010. They were woken up at 5 a.m. to their surprise and to let them know they had court. They went there a little flustered but at the same time with peace, reciting the prayer you say every Sunday from Ephesians 1, 17 to 19. That's why we went back to that prayer. God said, you don't cut my prayer out. All three of them were released. No parole, no probation. Mr. Sidney McFarland asked the court if the judge would grant him an issuance of a passport. The judge agreed for not only a passport, but recommended that he work in a half house, halfway house as a counselor. So all three of them had favor all around. It's very hard for prisoners to get a job, but all of them are working within two days of their release. Praise God. These three men were men of God, called and appointed and anointed. They were preaching the word of, in their units and conducting Bible studies as well. Praise God. Some of the prisoners would like to send you a donation for the CDs to your ministry. Can you receive a transfer of foreign funds? I've written no. Please let us know. Thank you for your blessings. We've been praying for your church. Mrs. Lewis is a blessing to so many of us. You're blessed to have a member like her. She's tough on herself and tough on the inmates. All glory goes to God and we will celebrate that Jesus is alive. 
I must mention here, did Mrs. Lewis tell you she was nominated Best Counselor of the Year for three years back to back for her compassion, dedication and commitment towards the inmates? The award was given to her by our governor, Pataki, a few years ago. She carries her anointing everywhere she goes. God bless her and more importantly, God bless you and your church. When you do visit us here in USA, please allow me to take you to dinner and schedule a day for the prisoners as they would like to put their face to the preacher. Do you have a website? Mrs. Lewis says you are a very tough teacher like her teacher, Evan Sharon Austin. She says he lives up to his teaching and he walks you walk. I thank you for your love and compassion. You do have a passion. We live all that. We truly appreciate you and your message. Keep the faith and remember, you have a family praying for you and your family on this side of the globe. Have a blessed and peaceful week. Can we all get your teaching from now on? Thank you. Do you believe God can do because of the blood? It's got nothing to do with us. It's his blood. It's his word. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of the testimony. Three people, 20 years in prison. And you know what? Last night, this had gone into my spam. I didn't even see the message for days. Then I was planning to empty my spam. And I see this message. Last night again, I'm about to empty my spam. A new mail. The second one. This is from one of the prisoners. He has written. It's beautiful. <coughs> it's there in the message too. Letter 2. In that. It's beautiful. This is not from the chaplain. This is from the prison. Because I want you to know, by every little thing which you did, we pray, we come together, we fellowship, everything that we do, God is doing His part. We can be sure about God's part that He will, He will do His part. We are faithful. He is faithful. Amen? <coughs> Dearest Pastor James, this is a prison. I won't mention his name because this is the message you heard. When you have been cleansed by the blood, there is no shame. You have been a blessing to all of us in and out of prison. God is so awesome and his wisdom is so infinite that only he can do all the things he does. Once I got to the courthouse, I kept reciting the prayer from Ephesians 1, 17 to 19. Let me tell you a little about my lifestyle and my past. I was known as the big wig in the world of drugs. I pleaded guilty to a life sentence. I was raised up in a Baptist church in Alabama, real country town, lived with different women and had children by all of them. I know I have four, but I am sure I have more children out there. Traveled everywhere in the States and lived in a world where I always had to watch my back. It was not easy. I walked around mad at God and mad at myself and the world. So each time I got mad, I carried a weapon and would scare the people away from me by misusing my manhood and my weapon. I met this young lady in prison who came with another sister to share the word of God. I had no clue who she was. All I knew that she was a no-nonsense lady. Her approach was humble, yet she was very tough with us men. I asked her one question, has God forgiven me? And she said, have you repented brother? And are you sick and tired of being sick and tired? And I said, yes. She said, godly sorrow is not just crying because you are locked up and embarrassed about your situation. Godly sorrow is true repentance, turning from your old ways and change of mind, change of desire and change of plan. She gave us all the teachings on repentance and she left. She was from Westchester County LTD Ministries Church in New York. I had no clue this was the same lady who went to be a missionary in India. We all thought she was from Puerto Rico and even I thought Sister Elsa was Hispanic. Father Paul told us it was Mrs. Lewis and I freaked out, could not believe it was the same person when we started receiving our CDs from India. I heard the first CD on sin, iniquity and transgression five times and said the prayer many times, Re renounced all the demonic spirits. I had a legion in me and I believe I still have not got rid of all of them. I do not know, I do not believe Mrs. Lewis will remember me as they meet so many of us with almost the same questions. When you see a good looking woman in prison and the way she conducts herself as a Christian, it leaves an impression. She is a praying woman and she keeps it real. Please convey my regards and ask her permission if may I may correspond with her. Sister Elsa is hearing it for the first time, okay? I haven't read it even to her because this came last late night. I downloaded almost all your messages, went around to all my enemies, asked for forgiveness. And also from my children's mamas. And I shared a few of the messages with my father and my mother who are in their 80s. They also repented and recommitted their lives to God. My older children are very bitter and angry with me. 
I invited them over to my halfway house where I work and asked them to please forgive me as their father. Three of them have been going to the mosque. So I asked them why. They said, this Christian thing is not working. We are jinxed. That was an opening line for me to talk about iniquity. We finally cried, prayed together as a family, we hugged, we all repented. And my oldest son listens to your messages on the net and he has passed them on to some of his friends at work and college. My daughter is still not convinced that I am a changed person, but my actions, my way of life will bring all of them to the Lord. I trust God and I know that he will make a way. I am determined to walk with Jesus. All glory and honor and praise go to the Most High God, the God who reigns and the God who is so merciful and compassionate. Our everlasting Father, our wonderful Counselor, our Prince of Peace. Once God gives me the opportunity and He opens a door for me, a few of my brothers out here, we will visit your church and LTD Asia. Pastor James, if there is anything we can do from here, please do not hesitate to ask. I will even clean your bathrooms. We must start from the bottom to reach the top in the ministry. We do it all for the glory of God, not for name or fame. My phone number is 6... Okay, leave that. Don't call him up, okay, please. Thank you for your kindness and your zeal for the Lord. May, your, may God bless you and your church and your faithfulness to his calling. Please keep in touch when time permits your younger brother in the Lord. I won't tell you her name because you shouldn't feel embarrassed when he comes over here who he is. You know what? The blood works. We heard the word. We read two testaments. Do you believe the blood works? You have to believe the blood. You have to believe the word. It works. He didn't need anybody to deliver him. He delivered himself by believing in the work of the blood. He renounced and the demons left. And he started Bible studies in the prison. How many of us have started Bible studies at home? Honestly, God is asking. We have homes. Maybe only nobody will come. Start off with one person. Why? Why don't we start? Why don't we call somebody we know? Why don't we pass us CDs? If you are worried your friends will come to church, you can take the label of just give the CDs. The word of God helps. I'm not inviting people to church. We don't want the church to grow, we want the kingdom to grow. We want people to be delivered. Twenty years in the prison? Because so many, so many are living in prison walls inside. You need to come out. The word of God works. The word of God heals. The word of God delivers. I, I was so touched. I was so touched when I looked at this man and saw his passion. Because I need a few people to clean my bathrooms. <laughs> Honestly. Because last evening I cleaned the bathrooms in the church. And I went back home, I rejoiced, I got no problem. And then I see somebody volunteering to clean the bathrooms. Amen.